Benchmark, the voice of business. Presented by LMD. On this edition of Benchmark, Murtaza Jaffa Jade, Managing Director of JB Securities, joins us in the studio today as we continue to focus on good governance in Sri Lanka. Then, Nielsen's Managing Director Sharang Pan comments on the Business Confidence Index, which continued to climb in September. And the final word goes to LMD columnist Dashal Dimel as he gives us his unique perspective on Sri Lanka's macro outlook. That's the lineup for Benchmark. Hello and welcome to Benchmark, the Big Picture Business Program. I'm Savitri Rodrigo. We are continuing our focus on governance today. And with us in our studio is Murtaza Jaffaji, the CEO of JB Securities, and he's also the head of advocacy at the CFA, CFA Society Sri Lanka. We are discussing Sri Lanka's business environment and also the country's prevailing investment climate as well as the performance of the capital markets of Sri Lanka. Now, Mutasa, welcome. And this is such a sort of a seems good governance, sometimes seems just like a common sense thing. But at the end of the day, it is rather complex, isn't it? What is the governance landscape like? First of all, thank you, Savitri, for inviting me today. Um, so this new government came on a platform of Yahapalanya, which is a system of good governance. Now, first of all, governance is uh, not a destination, but a journey. So if you look at it on a relative perspective, uh, it has significantly improved from, say, two years ago. But if you look at it in terms of what people's expectations were, it will fall short because people came with very, very high expectations. The second part I think that can really accelerate the governance process is that, uh, you know, a researcher called Mick Moore from the University of uh, Sussex has shown that countries in which citizens pay a lot more taxes enjoy much higher governance. And the causal relationship there is that basically you will hold the elected representative more accountable. So we are in some kind of a consolidation process where the government is imposing more and more taxes, especially if that mix changes more towards direct taxation, you will see a remarkable improvement in governance because we will all hold our politicians far more accountable than we are holding them now. There's been a hue and cry about increases in taxation anyway with strikes right. and protests, etc. Do you really think that in the short term these things can be implemented and also, the government has been in power for a little over one year. And is it realistic to have such high expectations and have all those come to fruition in such a short time? Well, as far as the tax proposals are concerned, we really don't have an alternative because we have ratcheted up such high debts over a period of time that it's increasingly hard for us to finance our expenditure by running successive deficits. Uh, so we have to implement it and I think as long as the two parties have a consensus, a minimum consensus, we can do it. The effort in increasing direct taxation is which matters and that will, the burden will come more on the rich. So politically it is possible. What about the uh, expectations that you were talking yeah. about? So the expectations have not been met. But I think that is because also the government has a poor communication strategy that especially in the local vernacular, they have to come on board and say that even if they cannot meet it, they have to explain to the people that the challenges, why it is so hard to live up to their expectations and perhaps uh, draw out a scenario and explain to them that if we do A, B, C, that we will be able to do these things. Now, the doing business rankings, in the doing business rankings, Sri Lanka went up six spots to 107. Still not good enough, mm -hmm. but we've gone up. Um, what do you feel that realistically the doing business environment has improved and what about the investment climate? Okay, so Savitri, you must understand how that indicator works. It's a World Bank measure. Uh, first of all, it's a relative indicator. So we improve on some elements and it's on three basic uh, frameworks. One is the macro economic framework in terms of inflation, taxation. Second one is the quality of institutions and third one is the quality of infrastructure. So although we may have gone up six points, uh, six relative points, other countries have moved ahead of us. So in absolute terms, we are improving, 
but in relative terms others are also improving faster than us that is why we are not making such a significant improvement and there are certain things holding us back. But if you generally see the sense that they have certainly been able to unblock a lot of things that were holding back development. But on the flip side, they have also caused a lot of uncertainty, especially on the taxation side that there is a lot of uncertainty, they have not implemented. And because we have a coalition government, you know, one section of the government is saying one thing, another section of the government is saying another thing. So, people are quite confused. So, that uncertainty has gone up. Now, uh, Mutaza, the investment climate, for instance, has it improved, do you think? There's, is there potential to improve and what more needs to be done? For instance, the 300% uh, tax on foreigners owning land has been removed. There's been uh, uh, sort of uh, the restrictions on foreign currency has been somewhat uh, decreased. Are all these going to help in bringing foreign investment in? Uh, well, that's one indicator. The, the main, main thing is, and I'm playing somewhat of an advisory role on this new agency for development. So, these are issues that I see on a regular basis. Uh, the investment climate is one indicator. Fundamentally, I mean, firms will come here if they can make profit, if this is a profitable environment. So, uh, the investment climate is being improved because there are committees working on this and a new set of laws are being also drafted so that the rights and privileges of the investors are better going to be protected. But again, it's a work in progress. So, we have to continuously keep improving. Muthasa, what do you think the government can do to induce foreign investment? Okay, uh, the first thing is that uh, we must have consistency of policy because we have all had a lot of inconsistency. Now, even if you take this Colombo port project, uh, okay, that was highly politicized, but again, there was a lot of uncertainty because the due process was not followed. So, if you want mega investment, so for example, the waterfront project, you know, when they started it, they started it with the assumption that they could have a casino and then the government changed and then there is no casino. So, whatever the policy is and whichever government there should be some of the big decisions we must have bipartisan approval and in some countries like Costa Rica etc there's a case study that when they bought in Intel both political parties signed off on the agreement so that if there was a change in government they would not renege on that so some of the large investments my suggestion is that we must have both parties of course now both parties are in government but they sign off so that they one party will not do undo the work of the last party what about sri lanka's capital market since you're well and truly in it how what has the performance been like say for the last in the last year so it has been range bound uh, so if you look at it that uh, markets work on expectations and also alternate options. Interest rates have gone up something like 3 to 4 percent. So, the fixed deposit that was yielding about 6, 7 percent is today yielding about 11 to 12 percent. So, most of the money has gone away from equities into fixed income instruments. So that has been a significant headwind. Then on the earnings side, the, the companies have done extremely well because we had a huge fiscal stimulus in 2015. But then the uncertainty about taxation and a higher tax burden is holding back uh, investment. Further, that uh, the environment from foreign investors were not so good for frontier markets, that frontier markets have not been doing well and emerging markets also were not doing well. There has been a rebound recently and we are seeing some more renewed interest coming back. In terms of, you know, the monetary policy stability, uh, since we got a new governor from 1st July, generally the confidence on the central bank, etc., has significantly improved, especially the outlook for monetary policy. They have tightened. So, investors have one less of a worry to think about. And if some of the policies and the projects that the government intends to do starts getting activated, I think the confidence will come back to the market and you will see a, perhaps a better market in 2017. What about rules and ethics with regard to capital markets? Do you think uh, these are being followed to the T or are there little uh, grey areas that we need to worry about? So, the two, two are different. Uh, the rules, basically, uh, the problem with the rules is that uh, uh, they are written in terms of outputs, not necessarily outcomes, because ideally you would try to craft them in terms of broad principles. And I know that the ACC is drafting up uh, a new act which will try to implement some of it in terms of principles. Second is that uh, our enforcement has always been weak. 
because as an institution the SEC had been weakened under the previous government although now there is new management and a new board who is trying but it takes a long time to rebuild. Uh, the second thing is that I think uh, there is just that much a regulator can do. Market forces are much more powerful than any regulator. So we have to change the way our market works so that if there are any inefficiencies or exploitation in the market, the market itself will self-correct and that's how most efficient markets in the world work. I'd like to continue this discussion after a commercial break, Murtaza. So ahead on the program, Murtaza Jaffaji talks about the Right to Information Act and also a little bit about the law and order situation in Sri Lanka. Stay with us. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. We understand that savings provide for life's special moments. That's why we were the first bank to introduce an incentivized savings scheme, Pathum Vimana. We changed how a nation felt about savings because we believe in banking beyond transactions. HNB, your partner in progress. Thank you for staying with Benchmark. We are discussing governance and other related topics with Murtaza Jaffaji, the CEO of JB Securities and also the head of advocacy at the CFA Society Sri Lanka. Murtaza, just before the commercial break, I was also asking you about ethics in the capital markets. Uh, are these being followed? Okay, so ethics is uh, at the heart of capital markets for the simple reason that markets rely on trust. And if trust is broken, uh, then basically people lose confidence in markets and stay away and this has been a global problem and the CFA Institute has been championing the cause of ethics and I as the head of advocacy locally main role was to promote ethics so uh, I'm afraid that uh, the ethics are not in the best state in Sri Lanka because basically we have had a deterioration in the culture of ethics general ethics in the country and which has percolated into the capital market and you know we have had a lot of unethical practices so two things have happened that one is that people who committed unethical practices have not been found fault with because the legal system is very slow but it is moving very slowly and perhaps some convictions may come in future second thing is that you know there is an ignorance of what good ethical practices are and one of our roles is to try to improve that uh, the third is that there has not been good examples that, uh, you know, some of us have to show success by playing by the rules, by being ethical. So that at least people have alternate role models to follow. Because at the moment, the role models that people see who have been successful have not necessarily been playing by the rules. And then the younger generation feel that success is by going that route without going on the proper route and being ethical in your conduct. Uh, Sri Lanka dropped 10 spots to number 58 in the WJP Rule of Law Index. Realistically and on the ground, what is your assessment of the law and order situation in Sri Lanka? So I can only ask, answer you by something that I experienced last Saturday. Uh, police would stop me and said that I was fiddling with my phone, you know. I, I have a hands-free kit on my car, so I was trying to call somebody, but I had to fiddle with the phone. And then he stopped me. And he said that uh, you have been doing something wrong and you have been fiddling with your phone. So basically he issued me a ticket. 
And unlike my previous experiences where the traffic police solicit some kind of inducement, uh, this instance he didn't induce me. I simply accepted my ticket and paid my fine. So my most recent uh, experience has been good that at least perhaps with independent police commission and a new DIG, I mean IGP that was appointed by the Constitutional Council, maybe some of that good work is percolating down to the grassroots level. The Right to Information Act, for instance, uh, was uh, the bill finally became a law. How is the implementation of that Right to Information Act actually likely to play out in the local context? So too, too, too early to say, Savitri, but um, our job primarily is in research and getting information from the government is extremely difficult. So we would be one of the earliest proponents to test that and I'll have to defer to a alternate time to tell you how practical it is on the ground. Have the ministries, the de departments, the public sector per se be, a been actually told what this Right to Information Act is all about and how open they need to be or transparent? No, I don't think. There would be a long way to go on that and whether they also have all the information readily available to be able to dissipate that when citizens come and ask them because the government is not the best bookkeeper you know all the information even if you take typical annual reports of state enterprises they are so delayed sometimes delayed by over one year two years etc the accounts of course have to be submitted to parliament by a certain date but uh, there is a big educational element to be made, awareness element and plus also readiness that they have to be able to compile all this information that the public will ask so that it can be readily given and most importantly they must give it in a format that is usable like an electronic format. Like for us as analysts we would rather like to get it in an electronic format than in hard copy format. On that note, how do you see development prospects for Sri Lanka? So Savitri, uh, so finally basically development will be that the lives of people get better. Uh, so two, two things have to happen. One is that we have to create more employment, uh, especially for females. Because of female labor participation rate, which means that the number of people above the economically active age working in the labor force or actively participating or looking for employment is only 35%, while male it's 70%. So we have to create a lot more employment opportunities for the women in the country. The second thing is that uh, we have to improve productivity because for every rupee that we invest, the output that we get on an economic basis is insufficient. And we can only increase productivity uh, by having more competition. So we, you know, the consumer must have more choice. Uh, we can't have these very high tariff protection and tariff barriers uh, protecting certain vested interests in the economy. Everything has to have a lot more competition. We must promote a lot more competition because when you have more competition, it drives down prices. It reduces inefficiency. It encourages innovation. Then it encourages further productivity improvement. Then people reinvest and grow the business because the prices come down. People can afford. So it's a huge virtuous cycle that gets created. So these are the two main things that we have to grapple with, how to increase competition in our economy at every level and second is that how to create new employment opportunities, especially for our women. Thank you, Murtasa. Very interesting spot for us to conclude our interview. Thank you very much for being with us on Benchmark. Thank you for inviting me, Savitri. So we've been chatting on governance and various issues with Murtaza Jaffaji, the CEO of JB Securities and Head of Advocacy of the CFA Society Sri Lanka. On the other side, we have Anushan Sarvalaja. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC.
Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. Nearly 60% of all businesses in our country are SMEs. Some of our most growth-oriented financial solutions have been customized to serve this sector. That's why we have invested over 500 billion rupees to support the backbone of our economy. Because we believe in banking beyond transactions. HNB, your partner in progress. Hello and welcome back to Benchmark. I'm Anshin Selvaraja. Now for a closer look at the latest on the Business Confidence Index. Joining me is the Managing Director of Nielsen, Sharang Pant. Welcome back to the show, Sharang. Now, uh, to start off with, the BCI gained uh, uh, 24 basis points. Now, uh, what are the reasons behind this uh, this rather large uptick? Yeah, so last month we saw some good headwinds and BCI went up to 140. Those same signals are continuing now and uh, the index has in fact gone up to 150. Uh, perceived clarity on investments and fundings, it seems that's helping the index move up. Uh, there's investment that is being promised in these mega infrastructure projects that's believed to be uh, creating uh, job opportunities and that's helping the uh, sentiments to move up further. What do the respondents think about the performance of our economy? Well, the good thing is uh, almost about 40% of the respondents feel the economy is going to improve in the next 12 months. If you look at this number, it was around 30% in the last month. Now, some of the reasons that are being said is uh, Quarter 1 of 2016, we saw a 5.5% growth in the GDP. That dropped down to 26 in quarter 2, the reasons being the floods and the slowdown in infrastructure. Uh, some recent news from the government makes the businesses feel that it's reviving again. And it's more forward-looking sentiments which makes them feel that the economy is on the uh, upswing once again. What about a business and investment prospects then? Uh, that's an interesting question because what we see is uh, about 60% of the respondents say that uh, the investments will look up in the next one year. Uh, but when we talk about short term, that number comes down to 40%. So 40% of the businesses say that investment will improve in the next quarter. It basically means that for the short term, it's still a wait and watch game. They want to see what happens in the next one quarter or so and then make the larger investment decision for the next few months. What would be your projections then? Well, at this stage, uh, I would say it's uh, a fluctuating projection and the swings could be large in both directions. Again, it depends on how much clarity is there on policies and uh, announcements that the government is making. Uh, what the respondents tell us is uh, what they are hearing is only from the media. It's not yet coming from the government. So they're waiting for the government to make some more announcements, get in more clarity, and then probably there would be some stability in the confidence index. Thank you for joining us, Sharang. My pleasure. That was the Managing Director of Nielsen, Sharang Pant. After a short commercial break, we will be back with the latest on the economy. Stay tuned. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. Gami Pubudua, our microfinance offering makes it possible for the youth of this country who have a viable business plan but lack the funds to realize their dreams. 
we are committed to grassroot level entrepreneur development because we believe in banking beyond transactions. HNB, your partner in progress. Welcome back to the show. I'm Anushan Selvaraja. Now for a closer look at the latest on the economy. Joining me is economist and LMD columnist Deshal Dimel. Welcome back, Deshal. Now, uh, to start off with, uh, how do you see our economy faring at this point of time? Anushan, things appear to have taken a slight turn for the better in uh, the second half of uh, 2016. First half was quite uh, quite tough. We saw uh, interest rates had been rising throughout. Inflation was also on an upward trend. Economic growth in the second uh, quarter of 2016 was particularly bad at 2.6%. Uh, of course, quite negatively influenced by the flood situation and a number of other factors that disrupted both the agriculture and the industrial sector. Um, afterwards, in the second half of the year, the first couple of months of July, August, things have been improving to, to some extent. It appears now that we have reached a peak of the interest rate cycle that we are at. Um, and that is certainly uh, positive because that um, what we can expect is interest rates to remain around these levels and then start to slowly ease off into the, the latter part of 2017. Um, again, what we are seeing is that if you look at the most recent uh, government securities bond auctions and bill auctions, there's been a slight coming down of, uh, of um, interest yields on, on those, which is again the underlying uh, interest rate determinant for the, for the rest of the market. And if you see this uh, trend uh, continuing, that certainly would be a positive for a general stabilization and then a, a later on economic improvement towards the latter part of 2017. So what are the driving factors behind this? So I would say, as I said, the, the biggest influence is the, the interest rate cycle and the fact that I believe that we are now at, at the peak and probably going to be uh, stable at these levels for a, for a few months and then downwards after that in 2017. The, there are three, I would say, three main factors uh, behind this um, the change in the interest rates. Uh, the first is the fact that uh, with the IMF um, with the IMF program coming in, uh, there has been a greater sense of renewed uh, confidence in the, in the Sri Lankan economy. Uh, so we've seen money, foreign foreign investment coming back into Sri Lankan uh, rupee denominated treasury bill and bond markets. So as we know, in March 2016, we had a um, it came to a, a bottom, uh, a, a low level of 220 billion rupees worth of foreign investment in uh, rupee securities. That has, as of now, reached about 314 billion rupees. So certainly a, a, a big upward trend in the last uh, in the last six seven months or so, and that has certainly helped. To, uh, to to ease pressure on the on what on the rising interest rates that we saw in the earlier part of the year, uh, a second factor was the successful international bond uh, issues by the uh, by the government. Uh, so we saw the the in, in July there was a dual tranche um, sovereign bond of 1.5 billion dollars at a very attractive rate, uh, and subsequently there was also a syndicated loan which is also uh, a fairly good uh, good rate. So that has eased the immediate cash flow needs of the government as well. Uh, the third factor, I would say, has been the, the improvement on the fiscal side. Um, there has been an improvement in revenue collection, still below budgeted uh, anticipated levels, but certainly a big improvement compared to what we saw in 2015. Uh, and with that improvement on the, on the fiscal side, there has been probably a, a slightly less pressure for the government to borrow from the domestic market as well. Again, reducing the impact, on, you're reducing the pressure on the liquidity front of the domestic market. So all of these factors have combined to um, to support interest rates at these levels without creating pressure for them to go up a lot further. And I think that is what will really underpin the improvement in the economy going forward from here. What would then be the risks, Desha? So the risk factors would really be whatever would uh, undermine this confidence that has been built up. So one of the major factors has been, as I said, the IMF program. Now, if we see any significant delays in the IMF tranches, I think that would be seen as a negative, uh, negative by foreign investors in particular. So one of the one of the risks that I see going forward is um, this issue with regard to some of the new reforms that were, that are envisaged in the program. Uh, and if the government is unable to uh, to push those reforms forward, that may result in some delays in, in the IMF tranches, and that I think could have a, a negative impact, which could uh, again result in f uh, foreign capital moving out of the economy. The second big risk is, on, of course, on the global side. Uh, we are expecting the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates before the end of this year, and that I think has been factored in by the market to some extent. Uh, the question is, though, the the announced pace of of interest rate increases in 2017. Now, if that is higher than what the market is expecting, then again, we're likely to see the, the, the risk of capital moving out of emerging frontier economies, Sri Lanka included. Uh, again, I, don't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't expect that to happen given the current health and the stability of the global economy, which is not at an optimal level. I'd be surprised if the Federal Reserve were to move faster than the market is expecting. But I would say that those two risks are the biggest risks to the current outlook that Sri Lanka has. Thank you very much for joining us, Desha. Thank you.
That was Economist and LME Columnist, the Shalti Mel. Thank you for watching Benchmark and we hope to see you again next time.